Bienvenidos, damas y caballeros. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that is uh, welcome again, ladies and gentle fish, to the philosophy <laughs> of art and science show. We're joined again by the inimitable, by the incomparable, by the irrepressible Armando Yi Rodriguez, a.k.a. Armando Yi Jr. Armando, ¿cómo estamos? Muy bien, señor Henock. Muy bien, gracias. Gracias por tenerme aquí. Uh, estoy muy agradecido y principalmente muy emocionado. I'm very happy and very glad to be here, Henock. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be sharing this moment with you and your viewers. So it's a real honor and uh, much appreciate your bilingualness, by the way, in that introduction. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Igualmente, I also appreciate your bilinguality. Uh, can I say bilingüidad? Uh, yes. Gracias. And I want to say that today I noticed two things that are separate from your two previous interests on the show. By the way, you, you're, you got to be close to a record. Guest no, a third appearance by a guest. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I got to say, I was, uh, I was uh, reluctant to do an episode right now, but Armando is a salesman at heart. He knows how to verbally twist your arm and sweet uh, <laughs> whisper sweet nothings into your ear. And uh, he knows how to tickle your fancy and tickle your ear and maybe tickle something else. So oh, I really yeah. appreciate you joining the show tonight. But the two things I noticed that are different from the first two ex uh, experiences we had on this program. First, you've got that fresh cut. So tell us a little bit about how you got a haircut. I know a lot of people are worried about grooming in the pandemic. It's mm -hmm. become a fashion to grow mm -hmm. out the beard as if people are in a cave, as if they don't have their normal shaving equipment. So just tell me <laughs> how you've gotten your latest grooming on. I'll tell you, it was not easy. I, I got to tell you, it was long overdue. It had been two, three weeks. I hadn't had a haircut. And I said, my gosh, I can't get a haircut anywhere. It's been a little bit overdue. I usually get it about once a month. And it was as a result of this pandemic. They shut California back down. Uh, barber shops had to be shut down. So now it's, it was becoming a little bit more uh, of, a, of an enterprise, really, to get a haircut. You had to get a reservation. You had to call in. You had a. Was that through know, an app or did you solicit somebody on Craigslist to cut your hair? That's a good question. No, it was a straight up just walk into the old school barber shop and see, hey, are you guys open? I like to just walk in and say, hey, l listen, is there a little room available? I don't like to make too many reservations, uh, so to say, especially if I, it's not the local yeah. barber, barber that I You have to. some reservations so about making open, reservations? Uh, well said. Well said. Thank you very much, Hanok. Yeah. Uh, it to, and then so one day I was driving down the street here on Broadway by my block and I see a little barber shop open. Uh, local shop. I walk in. They take a little walk in. Mask on. It was done. Young lady. Uh, I would say mid thirties, uh, maybe forties. Cut hair phenomenally well. Uh, I know you have been well known also to have froze, which is a wonderful bit. One of these days, I hope to grow a fro. By the way, I don't know if I can do it, but uh, a fro would be nice. I think. Uh, more importantly, it's just good to stay groomed, so to say. But that that is. Thank you for noticing my haircut, by the way. <laughs> I do, I do. You always used to tell me, you know, about your proud Chinese heritage. A lot of people focus too much, you know, on Mexico and they neglect China. And I think you used to tell me that your inheritance from the Chinese side was predominantly the hair. I think there are less Afros in China. Um, mm -hmm. So that that might not be possible. I would like to see an Afro in, in, in China or it really is in any way. Afros, what, what prompted the Afro, by the way? Well, there was, what time period was it? Because I, I know 80s, was it 70s? Or was it, how did it, that hairstyle evolve? I don't know if you've yeah, yeah, I know a little bit about it, right? So I was mm -hmm. in, very into the Black Panther movement, especially in high school. I found a way to sneak it into our American history classes and oh. and uh, do some projects, both on Stokely Carmichael, later called Kwame Ture, as well as mm -hmm. on the whole Black P Panther Party, right, with Huey Newton mm -hmm. and with uh, Sada Shakur and all of the greats, right? Kanye's mom, Tupac's aunt, like so many people were a part of the <laughs> sit-ins and everything that they did. But the big idea behind it was that part of the definitions of beauty or aesthetic pleasure in the United States were based off of an Anglo-Saxon model, which was the dominant culture of the United States and still is relatively. And so the idea of the Afro was an idea for men and for women to resist what they thought was a Eurocentric point of view of beauty which was subjective and was used subjectively to put down, to lower the self-esteem and to 
commit psyops against the black populations of the United States. So oh in God. the American context, that was that resistance. In Ethiopia, there have been many different periods of the Afro's prominence. One of the most prominent is a period known as Zamana Arbenyoch, which is the era of the patriots. And so mm -hmm. when we had a six-year Italo-Ethiopian war, the second Italo-Ethiopian war against the fascist Mussolini, in fact, the founder of fascism, a word that is thrown around a lot these days is fascism, but the genuine founder of etymological, definitional, historic fascism, Benito Mussolini, who people mm -hmm. try to draw uh, illusions with Trump with, but the real Mussolini, not the fake Rick Ross, the real Rick Ross, the real mm -hmm. Benito Mussolini. When he was besieging Ethiopia, several, um, well, not even several, I could say a majority of the fighters said, we're going to terrify these white men some of them would terrify them by cutting off the private parts of the Italians and wearing it around their necks as necklaces and then threatening others with that. Others would uh, scare them off by having what they call a lion's mane. Another way that they would refer to the Afro is a lion's mane. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was part of the scare tactics in the war that preceded, just preceded, immediately preceded the Second World War. Unbelievable. Now, for those of us that may not be familiar with fascism is, can you please give us a brief, uh, even me, I mean, I, I have a, an idea, but I, I'm not entirely sure what that entire, what in your words does that mean? <clears throat> Great question. Put, I think the word is abused and applied too loosely, too liberally nowadays. Definitional fascism. Mm. In order to understand that, you have to understand the left-right perspective in an etymological and a historic way, which is not the way in which most people use that word. Sometimes people use the word so amorphously, you have to ask yourself a question. Are Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama on the left? Or is Dennis Kucinich and Ralph Nader and Jill Stein on the left? They have mm -hmm. radically different positions and both are called leftist. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will say, the people who are more against the state are the real progressives and the others are just liberals. Mm -hmm. But other people turn around and say, well, the classical liberal was more like this and so they're more classically liberal and the others are the progressives. So a lot of these terms, progressive, democrat, liberal, neoliberal, they get thrown around very loosely. So in order to explain fascism, I have to explain left-right. In the original historical etymological sense of liberal and conservative, the left were people who sat on the left during the French Revolution in the assembly that was deciding how the government would proceed. The people on the right were conservatives, and what they were conserving, right, getting to the etymology, the definition, was mm -hmm. the ancien régime. As a French Ooh. speaker, you will appreciate that. Yes. The old regime or the ancient mm -hmm. regime, which mm -hmm. means the monarchy and the priesthood, mm. pretty much. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth, if you remember him, and Marie Antoinette, the mm -hmm. one who said famously, "After us, the deluge," or mm -hmm. basically, "F the poor." Oh and God. on the other side, on the left, you have Frederic Bastiat, and oh you my. have Joseph Proudhon. Oh so God. Proudhon is the prototypical anarcho-communist mm -hmm. or anarchist, and Bastiat is the prototypical free marketeer. And oh the important God. thing is both of them stood by each other's side. Although one believed in mm -hmm. markets and one believed property was theft, they stood side by side with one another on the left against the priesthood and against the aristocracy. And so mm -hmm. that's what the left is. That's what the right is. The maximum right you can go is total power. Every means of production, every factor of production in the economy is under total control and total ownership of the state. That's the far right. The farthest left you can go is anarchy. My Everything gosh. else is in between those. And anarchy, of course, means that the state has no control and no ownership over any of the means of production. And then the question is, do we have a bunch of communes or do we have a bunch of firms and cooperatives? And that's mm -hmm. the difference between Bastiat and Proudhon on the left. But mm -hmm. on the right, it's varying degrees of ownership and control of, again, different factors of production, meaning 
steel production, wood production, your type of film production, mm -hmm. security production, law production, education production, just any anything in the economy you can name. Mm -hmm. So fascism is a child of the ancien regime, mm -hmm. and it is, uh, an, an, I would say, a brother, a half-brother, or a step-brother to um, Stalinism. My gosh. Or Marxism, writ large. Mm -hmm. And so some of the issue is that some people say Stalin is a leftist and Benito Mussolini is the, a rightist. Now mm -hmm. let's talk about the difference between the two. In the <laughs> Marxism of Mao and of North Korea, although North Koreans call it the Juchi system and of, mm -hmm. uh, and of, of the Soviet Union, you have every factor of production. The means of production is owned by the state and controlled mm. by the state. In the fascism of Hitler and of Mussolini, they want private ownership of the means of production as much as possible, although they, they reserve a lot of the government functions as most places do, right? Like uh, national security, they didn't privatize, and national law, they didn't privatize. Those were under their ownership. But most things they want to privatize, quote unquote, but they want to control it. Mm. So you have to ask yourself the difference. If somebody owns it and controls it, and someone says they don't own it, but they control it, what's the difference? Mm, that's a good question. How would you explain fascism to a seven-year-old? Because I know you mentioned it's like Marxism, it's like Stalinism, but what is the characteristic of this? If, if there was a seven-year-old young boy or woman and they asked you, what is Fascism that mean? <laughs> means they claim to love their country mm. and their particular ethnic group or culture mm. Mm -hmm. the most. Mm. And they say everyone else is inferior, is less mm, than. My gosh, yeah. And they yeah, want to a... control everyone's job. What are do you, you call that extreme? Are you a clown? They want to control the clown industry. Are you a policeman? <laughs> they want to control the police industry. Are you a yeah. juggler? They want to control the juggling industry. Do you sell gold? They want to control the gold industry. Are you a teacher? They want to control education. Are you yes. a grocery store owner? They want to control the grocery uh are you know are are you a, a strip club owner? They want to control the strip club. Do you sell mm -hmm. bananas on the street? They want to control that. Do you spit <laughs> fire at the border? They want to control that. That's mm -hmm. fashion. My God, yeah, an overreach of power, if you will. And they they just want to overstep their boundaries in several directions and well, uh, it's really interesting. Take overreach yeah. is an opinion. They mm. would consider it reach. Mm. So That's whether it's point. under or over is an opinion. The fact. Mm -hmm is that they're seeking control. And that's a good point. That's a good point. And it's done through various means and ways. Now, let's briefly And, and talk uh, before we go to the next topic, yeah. the, the, the prototypical fascist regimes, mm -hmm. although Japan uh, muddies the waters a little bit because they're kind of imperial and, and shouting out the old shogun empire, is basically <laughs> the Axis powers. Mm -hmm. Japan, Germany, and Italy in World War II. So basically, oh if you want to know what fascism is, study Japan, but especially Germany and Italy in World War II. Mm -hmm. Let us, uh, I was going to say, re briefly recall Pearl Harbor. Remember that day? My God, boy, that is uh, some very intense uh, wartime there. Uh, bring up the Japanese. But no, I was going to say, what, one thing that I do have to ask you, though, is in terms of uh, simply biblical elements i know we're, you and i were discussing darius before we got on the show but what does the bible say about capitalism hanok in terms of just you know uh controlling or over because i know there's a couple of kings uh you know king Sol solomon of course and uh darius we we're discussing what do you think the bible says about these things i know um oftentimes we like to like to look at this uh from a historical perspective but uh i would uh, yeah I, I got to be honest with you. It's a, it's a longer conversation, so I'm going to have to shelf that conversation. What I could say briefly is for those who want to know, <laughs> there's an uh, economist named Gary North. Yes. And Gary North has a whole series of like 10 books. At one point, I said I was going to make a commentary on, on each of his books, and I never ended up uh, doing it. So I failed. So I'm sorry, Gary North out there. But I have... <laughs> I think uh, at least two of his books um, oh my on, and his argument is that the Bible demands capitalism. Now, mm. the issue before people freak out is the way mm. he defines capitalism is very mm. different. There's a great writer, Kevin Carson, mm -hmm. who talks about vulgar libertarians. And vulgar I really, libertarians. Vulgar libertarians. And what he calls the vulgar libertarian is the person 
who is constantly shifting the goalpost and the argument. So the question is, is what we have right now in the United States capitalism or is the status quo, is that capitalism or is capitalism some sort of ideal, ultimate freed market scenario that you want to do? And mm-hmm. he says the issue is they they talk about this theoretical abstraction about this world that's never existed, but then they go and defend Walmart, mm-hmm. which is you know the current system and which has many issues, right? It's subsidized by the Soviet system of roads in the United States. It's subsidized by so-called intellectual property and and many other things, uh, you know, um, local government rules that prevent smaller companies from opening up, rules that prevent bazaars and local markets from opening up. Uh, occupational licensing, commercial zoning, all, all these things make Walmart exist in the current system in an artificial way, making profits that it would not make mm-hmm. in a system where localism is propped up more mm-hmm. by the natural way of things. And mm-hmm. so anyway, it all depends on what you mean exactly by capitalism. What I can say mm-hmm. is uh, from reading Gary North's book, for mm-hmm. sure it talks about uh, it is against usury which is basically any sort of interest gain. So that throws away the whole fractal reserve banking system from the Federal Reserve down um, with it, which is, you know, in the status quo, but it's also for weights and measures. And so it would be against fiat currency, which is constantly Mm. debasing the currency. And it would be for more physical uh, currency or money like gold and silver and platinum. So mm-hmm. we can we can say that much at least with confidence, and that mm-hmm. property rights are protected, but ultimately no human being owns property mm-hmm. because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So it mm-hmm. protects property rights, but at the same time says that every person is merely a steward of oh. their property, mm-hmm. and they are the steward of God, and My so God. they own it, but they are demanded to share it with mm-hmm. with their neighbors, with strangers, and indeed with enemies. But let's move mm-hmm. on and let's go backwards and let's go back to the radio show that you had with Rob Unger, Rob you, and yes. tell me about the audio equipment that you used to record that show. I say this because this show from, I don't know, 2008, 2009, 2010, I would say is one of the earliest memories I have that incepted me with an idea that brought me into the podcasting world. That's right. Thank you for bringing that up, Hanuk. Yeah, it happened in back in college, uh, Pepperdine days. It was freshman, sophomore year. Uh, what was the I name? T- Excuse me? What was the name of the show? It was the show with Rob and Armando, and it was a podcast uh, we did uh, weekly, I want to say maybe twice a week, maybe daily uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, it would be me and a co-host similar to this, very similar to this situation. Always a co-host situation. You want to have more people in radio, I think. Uh, joining maybe in the studio so it's, it makes it a little bit livelier anyway started this uh, show radio show back in college as a result of my tv production just production broadcasting background no, really, no. because yeah. i do have a broadcasting background and uh, the radio show is part of broadcasting and so i, I decided to start a show along with on, late was it on TV. fm or satellite or where was the platform you know what? It was on FM. Uh, we broadcast throughout Malibu, but Rob and I actually recorded the show, and we would bring it back to the dorms, and everybody mm-hmm. would listen in. I remember it was we would play it back for the people at the dorm, and it got just live, review. live on your computers. Come again? Just live on your computers, or were you posting it somewhere online? We would bring, we would burn it. I would burn it onto a CD, then I would bring it back to the dorm, and I would pump it in on the TV, and a couple of people would listen to it. Rob and myself included. We just listened to ourselves. So you had live time. live shows. Yeah, it was kind of live. I mean, we would tape it, bring it, and then I'm sure maybe one or two people may. Have I don't mean you now. broadcast. I mean you are bringing it to an audience, right? Like for me, the next step of my platform mm-hmm. is to do this type of conversation, like have an event, Henok, in conversation with Armando Yud Rodriguez yes. at like some sort of like physical place, right? So that yes. it's. Uh, I think people are using the word digital right now, yes. where mm-hmm. there's a, a an element of it that is mm-hmm. physical. And an mm-hmm. element of it that is digital. So you had the the digital element that was mm-hmm. on the Earth Radio, mm-hmm. right? And then you had the physical element where you brought it to people where they actually were on burned CDs and played it for them in person. Yeah, 
Wow. I love that, man. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we need to get on. I mean, this is why, by the way, this is why I'm so grateful and uh, glad that you agree to do these things because I might, it's in me, Hino, to get on this microphone, which, by the way, yes, you're right. I just got this brand a new beautiful microphone for everybody out there. And I'm excited. Tell us about, about it. I, want, I wanted to yeah. kind of trace your usage of audio and culminate with this microphone, but talk yeah. to us about what sort of audio equipment did you have? Obviously, the university, I believe, was sponsoring that. that. Mm. Like, you had some sort of free access. I don't think you were paying, right? for studio time yeah no it was completely complimentary it was a, a legitimate full-on radio studio i think it was the best microphone for a mic you could have I, i'm not too sure of the name it, it was certainly it had a stand it was uh this one by the way is a usb condenser microphone it's probably this is just a plug and play little condenser microphone it looks nice uh you got the foam tip there too I it does have a nice yeah, foam tip and a little. Peep let's get into right it. Here. Yeah, let's get into yeah. it because I have I have a pop filter too. So yeah. I see this this device here for those yes. who are watching mm -hmm. prevents whenever we say words with p. Like yeah. if we wanted to say hippopotamus, if you wanted to say Peter Piper picked a pepper peppers or however that <laughs> wonderful exactly. idiomatic language goes, mm -hmm. it is helping to filter out the language that would otherwise cause our lips to spit on the microphone and and otherwise damage it and so it's it's more protecting to your ears i've actually gotten several compliments mm -hmm. from from people who are professionals in production in video yeah. and in yeah. audio and then random people who ask yeah. me what type of editing i do and i tell them you know i don't i don't <laughs> like to edit i'm a man who eats raw beef I, I eat raw fish i i upload raw episodes what i did is i invested my money into getting solid equipment so my microphone is blue yeti they do not sponsor this program mm -hmm. but shout out to them i think mm -hmm. it's about a 120 dollar mic that i bought which i mm -hmm. believe is the medium version they have a small version a large version i believe i got the medium version and i hocked out 120 dollars for this i hocked out about eight dollars for this is a o k e o a o k e o pop filter and in fact i bought this after i bought mm. this after when i began having ideas and really delusions of grandeur to become an audiobook narrator and and mm. now you know i got a couple audiobooks in the works so that's what i'm talking when i about. decided to do that i said i need a pop filter it's mm -hmm. not just toahado bible study it's the philosophy of art as well and i'm going to have audiobooks i need to go highest quality so mm -hmm. what did you do in finding your mic and it looks like you bought the mic i don't know if the foam part came with it and then tell me if the pop filter came with it or you got it from somewhere else this was a straight on i'm gonna be honest with you guys it was i went to amazon.com i clicked computer mic it was the first one that popped up bestseller i did i'll tell you what i did scan through them and aesthetically just by aesthetics i chose this one it looked the most professional it had a professional look i hope it sounds good you know i hope it sounds good well, time will tell it and, sounds uh, good and it looks then, good can you reveal yeah, to us exactly. the, the price just to give people a practical example? Forty dollars. Forty dollars. The toner. Yeah. The the TC seven seven seven. I know the blue jetties. Uh, well, how much is that? The blue yeti. It's one hundred and twenty dollars. Well, that's why you've gotten a lot of compliments. I was gonna, I myself complimented you, Henrik. You may remember that I complimented you. I was like, Henrik, excuse me. That is, in, in many ways, you inspired me to get this mic. That Your audio is so good. It's inspirational. Has anyone ever said that to you, Henrik? Your mic, you just your said it to me right now. To, and, and again, remember that this whole program was incepted by you. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, intellectual incest going on here back and forth. Oh my God. <laughs> and so it's giving birth to uh, wonderful children. And that's that's how the marketplace of ideas works. This is why I don't believe in so-called intellectual property because we, we are playing off each other. I think we were each other's muses. A lot of the time yes. we would come up with humor. You know, yes. we had this long standing joke in our undergraduate times because we had yeah. the same birthday in the same year that yeah. perhaps one of us was committing identity theft on the other and i remember there were some times where you would question you know am i henok or am i armando sometimes the line <laughs> between us itself because the yeah. venn diagram would overlap so much it would mm -hmm. baffle others we would go door to door knocking on people's doors just to check in on them doing uh, mental health yeah. checks at three in the morning and uh <laughs> you know they used to treat us as a, a two for one combo so i think oh, a lot boy. of people got to experience us and realize that the humor 
escalated the more the more time we spent together and so yeah. you know uh, you're, you're one of the only people who has free access to do unlimited episodes on this program about <laughs> any subject about magic well, about the bible about comedy oh about balloon twisting about yes. languages about audio content and production yes. video production film reviews yeah. mm -hmm. you name well it. Well, Hano Kita, do you mind if I share the story of how I got you to do this recording tonight right here? I, please, like please. I'd the, be insulted the, if you didn't share it. I, I would like, feel as if you don't feel a closeness to me. In fact, the fact that you <laughs> asked consent uh, before means you didn't understand that you already had consent. Well, thank you very much, Hano. The way that I... because. I had called Hanok. I had Hanok and I are good friends, and I hadn't conversed with Hanok for a while, and we started to converse. Oh, hold on, and for a yeah. while, you mean what? A day? Maybe a day or two. <laughs> been, yeah, we we do converse pretty frequently, just normally off the phone. And we began conversing. What would be a medium sized conversation, maybe three four minutes, and then I say to Hanok, Hanok, why not don't we too jump big, on? not too small? Yeah, not too big, not too small. And I say to Hanok, Hanok, why don't we jump on the mics right now and record this right right here? And you know, Hanok was he'd had a long day, understandably so. He's not. Uh, he wasn't prepared for that question, so he was kind of released two off. episodes already today. Got a third one I'm already going to release before recording this one. Holy smokes! This and the, but by the way, just a brief aside on that, I was telling Henok that he's been become very solicited. Which, by the way, I encourage it. Anything you want, Henok is very open and he's a very excellent worker. Highly recommend it. But anyway, just to briefly wrap up that quick little story there, uh, I say to uh, made a conversation. I said to Henok, Henok, we could be maximizing our conversation because. The content that we converse in, okay, I think it's pretty valuable. So I said, why don't we just record this and at least try to get something out of uh, what we're – because what we're conversing is exactly what we're talking about right now. It's wonderful. So that's why I'm grateful that we're doing this. Thank you, Hanok. Uh, and, yeah, so excited about these mics. And your your mic looks badass, man. It looks uh, uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Um, first of all, thank you for mm -hmm. all of your high praise. And again, mm -hmm. just I want you to know how influential you are in my life. We've worked <laughs> in several of the same environments before. We've gotten on the phone and cold yeah. called, you know, strange men before and Let, offered let's them talk to about get their money. You know, the Pepperdine call center for those of you that, because that, that was honestly good techniques, man. I use those to this day when I'm selling uh, selling uh, precious metals, if, if you would. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it was a great time. The great Abby Sherwood was our boss at the time. I, <laughs> I later, you know, I was really incepted by that place because you, you had left by that time. But I worked with uh, Nicolas over one of even our last summers, Nicolas Kennedy, not to be confused with Nicolas Gutierrez. And, yes. um, um, you know, one summer after we had graduated, I remember working with him and I was working under Deacon Alicia Atkins. And, you know, she oh, yeah. quit her job as the head of the call center to go be a deacon in the Protestant church. And I always think about myself. I Just the other day, I was looking through my stuff and I got a letter of recommendation from her. And I was like, yeah. wow, you know, I, I really became a deacon after she said that she was going to go leave her job to be a deacon. And at the time, it didn't make sense to me. She was making around 50K a year in like 2009, which was pretty good money back then, you know, fresh mm -hmm. out of college. And she just quits it to be a deacon. And I was like, man, what does that even mean? What what is it? I, I didn't even know what a deacon was at the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I was like, it was ruminating, you know, wow. in my mind. And who would have thunk it that seven years later I would become a deacon? Unbelievable! That's incredible. Now I didn't know that. So your deaconhood goes back to the call center at Pepperdine. It's my boss it. became a deacon. Yeah. She wow. quit her job to become a deacon. Do you think that incepted you with the idea to become a deacon as well? Do you think it was that individual? hundred percent. Yeah, let's say 100%. let's say somebody thinks they're not familiar with a Subaru mm -hmm. and they go and they go find some shady, fishy used car salesman who sells them a Subaru. <laughs> now they go on the road yeah. and they can't help but see Subarus everywhere. Yeah. So I think this is the beauty in ancient tongues of repetition. You mm. know, in the ancient days and in the ancient languages, they don't have emojis. They mm. don't have a difference between capitalized letters and lowercase letters like we have mm. in our Latinized and Anglicized alphabet. So how do they emphasize things in the texts that they write? They use mm. repetition. Mm. It's why so many times in the Bible, you hear you have to love God. You have to love your neighbor. You have to love mm. your enemies. Bless those mm -hmm. who persecute you. It's mm -hmm. like, wow. It's because... If you say it just one time, I mean, you could save a lot of manuscripts if you just say mm -hmm. it in one line. But yeah. instead, you repeat it and you mm -hmm. repeat it because that way the teaching seeps into you.
How many times do you hear your parents re re repeat themselves when they tell Man. you, tell us, share with us something your parents used to tell you to correct your behavior as a child? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I used to be a pretty bratty uh, when I was growing up, believe it or not, in the in the supermarket. Uh, I, you know, just playing around, uh, having a good time. I'd get the old, I don't know if your mom ever gave you the old pinch, but and I know it's that was back then, but a nice little good old pinch would certainly hurt and that would correct me right away. I mean, that and let me ask you, did pleasant. she just yeah. ever pinch you just one time or more mm -hmm. than one time? You don't have to say it exactly. And we could, of course, say this is a hypothetical situation. <laughs> No, I mean, talking about corrective means by parents. I mean, that, that's one instance that I remember. What do I remember? Was there a habit that I had had to be broken out of? I used to chew my pencils. I'll tell you that. I used to chew pencils. And I don't know, that just normally way, went away. But I used to chew uh, wooden pencils. I, what, and what, and uh, your father this, has a background in dentistry, right? Yes, my father does. So have, the yeah. reason I don't bring that up just yeah. as an aside, uh, yeah. but directly related to that. A, a person who specializes in dentistry, I'm sure, would know that chewing on pencils has effect on your teeth, right? Especially over a long period of time. Yes, yes, that is true. That is true. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was naturally corrected. I don't remember too much uh, disciplining there. But overall, I, certainly I do remember being disciplined once or twice. I mean, I wasn't the perfect. Uh, everybody had a little spell of, of mischief, so to say. But I, overall, it was a very nice time. Uh, I worked at the call center. Remember that, Henok? I worked at the call center. It was a good time. I remember having to, we had to read a script at the call center. Remember that? We had to read a script, which is a, not a bad technique in sales. You know, some would mm -hmm. say you just use a script. And then we had to ask five times. And you, I was very What impressed. did you ask for five times? You asked for a certain, because let's make it uh, clear here. This was a call center for student donations, I guess, or alum donations yeah, to the school for the Pepperdine Trust, I believe it was, and, mm -hmm. and trying to raise money for the Pepperdine Trust via cold calling or warm calling. I mean, these are alums after all, so I would call them warm leads. Um, and you yeah. get on the phone, put on a headset, click dial, and uh, I, would it stop dialing or would it just dial on its own, call after call? I'm not I don't know. Uh, it would that. stop. You have to, I think, click on the, the right person. Um, I think what Armando is getting at, yeah. and, and we'll talk about this, is that we talked about in our last episode, if I'm not mistaken, that I'm a master of games. <laughs> I think different people yeah. are on different spectrums in terms of their personalities. And mm -hmm. although there is a, rec a replication crisis in psychology and a lot of their papers are bullshit. I think that there is a certain amount of truth that can be gleaned from things like the five, the big five personalities or the Myers-Briggs or whatever. You know, it's not exact science. It's not physics. It's not math. It's not chemistry. Let's not get carried away. But there's something to it. It's a little bit better than astrology. At least mm -hmm. I want to think so. Maybe I'm lying to myself. In any mm -hmm. event, the stereotype, right? across cultures and across biological differences is that some people are more logical, some people are more emotional. The people who are said to be more emotional are said to be higher in trait agreeability and it's because they're trying to help others, that they care for others. And sometimes what they do is they prioritize the relationship of uh, two human beings over facts. Mm -hmm. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, bordering on autism. I'm at the level where sometimes I'm committed to the truth and facts over the feelings of other people. Mm. Now, where people delve into, you know, where, you know, what people would think of as sadism or autism would be the question is, are you ignorant of the feelings of others and proceeding based off what you believe to be the truth or facts based on that? Or are you doing so with full knowledge? Now, the mm -hmm. issue with me is more often than not, I'm doing it with full knowledge. And so that's what would make me not autistic or not on the spectrum there, but mm -hmm. still close to it. So let mm -hmm. me tell you what I mean by that. I was going to ask you about what the you mean game. by borderline autism. You the game. Go on. <laughs> the game. I said I'm a master of games. Why did I say that? The game is the script in the call mm -hmm. center. The game is that you have supervisors and managers and people above them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about the supervisor, but for sure the manager. And Armando actually geniusly and intuitively guessed that they make a percentage off of each donation. Now, they denied this fervently, <laughs> but I found it out years later. 
that they were <laughs> they were being misleading at the best case in the most polite way they were being misleading about this fact now i oh i gosh. thought you know i was naive and i just believed them when they say they're not but armando was suspicious of them <laughs> and i later was able to verify his suspicions so he had like, some insight he had some emotional intelligence early on but the <laughs> game that they require you and the financial incentive behind it is that on one end they tell you that what matters is that people donate and the actual fiscal amount is irrelevant and armando used to always be suspicious of that but that's <laughs> what they wrote down on a paper that's what yeah. they fed us in their trainings and that's yeah. what they told us and they said mm -hmm. No matter what the other person says to you on the phone, you are required to listen <laughs> at least four times. Now, Michel Foucault, who is one of the great postmodern thinkers, has this idea of the panopticon. And the panopticon is this great prison tool where there's a giant tower with one window. And the yeah. guard sits in the panopticon. And all the prisoners are all around them. And the issue is, at any moment, the panopticon could be looking at you. But you don't know when the panopticon is looking at you or whether they're, they're asleep. And so you're always on alert. This is the same principle behind people who have video cameras that may or may not be recording with a smiley face in liquor stores. <laughs> and policemen who put their cars on the road, whether or not there's a car. The idea is to keep you always fearing and always alert to make you think that they could always be there. The relation to the call center is that they would tell you, we're not going to notify you when we're going to listen to your call. These are the supervisors and the managers. But at any moment, we could be listening to your call and we will reprimand you if you do not ask four times. So what <laughs> would happen is we would start off asking someone for a donation of $1,000. <laughs> then we would go to $600, then we'd go to $300, then we'd go to $125. That's mandatory. Anything beyond that, you're just a great salesman. But that's mandatory. <laughs> the issue is by the time you get to about $600, some of the people will tell you that they have cancer. Some of the people will tell you <laughs> that their spouse has died. Some of these people will tell you that they're, they're being buried in housing payments or car payments. They just had a new baby. Some of these people will tell you they hate Ken Starr, who at the time was fighting <laughs> gay marriage in California and who uh, helped prosecute Bill Clinton and who helped um, you know, prosecute OJ or something like that. You know, th They would tell you different things. So what I mean by borderline autism and just pure logic, irregardless of feelings, is that in order to win the game of the script, no matter what the hell they said on the other side, not giving a damn about their feelings, just being obedient to the rules of the game, I would ask every time, $600, $1,000. It doesn't matter what they said, I'm dying, my husband <laughs> died. I'm, whatever they said to me on the other end, I would say, okay, I understand that, I empathize, but how about $125? <laughs> and so whenever they would listen to me, whenever the Panopticon would actually act on its power and listen to me, they had nothing wrong they could say about me. Beyond that, that's the floor. That's the floor. I took it above and beyond, and I would say to them, a fifth ask, and I would say, ma'am, sir, and this is a line that fed me, but they didn't believe in it in th themselves. I would say, can I get you to do just even $1 on a credit card today? And I said, even $1 could affect the rankings. The way that the U.S. News and World Report rankings work, if we get a higher percentage of alumni who give back even $1 on a credit card right now, you could increase the rankings of the university. You can tell people that you're in a top 50 university and the, the rankings could keep rising. It's going to make the university more prestigious, maybe get more endowments. It may improve the sports program. Whatever it is that the person likes, you can tell them and pitch them how mm -hmm. them giving a dollar on credit card work so one time our boss pulled us in pulled me into the room and they went over everything on the books and they said i gotta be honest i've listened to several of your phone calls and according to everything that we have written down you are blameless but um i have an <laughs> issue that you keep asking them for one dollar and uh you know it would be nicer if there was a higher donation i was like well i asked them everything that you asked me on paper and so what I mean is whatever they gave me, like explicitly <laughs> told me, I, I did it to a T. And so the complaints they raised were the complaints of unwritten rules. Sorry, uh, that was very long winded. Armando, you have to jump in and take over now.
Well, no, thank you for that explanation, Hino. Thank, that's a great story, man. I, one of my personal favorites. You worked at the call center for quite a few years, and I, it was a fun place. It was a fun place. It teaches you good skills. Honestly, those are the same skills that I would say are needed in sales today. I mean, you just have to ask several times. You have to ask for the sale, and you took it all the way. And potentially what they were saying is that, hey, listen, you close because in essence, you were closing the deal. When you, when you get them to put money on a card, that's closing the deal. And you were closing deals, but they were just tiny little deals, the one dollar deals. And I think I, I do remember you getting a couple of those. And uh, I got and, several. I got. That's I, why I got called into the office is because <laughs> I was technically because, correct. What I was doing is I know how to be obedient to the letter of the law, and yes. she was trying to form a sort of spirit of the law interpretation on unwritten rules. Have and you see, and those gray environments is where I I do bad in gray environments when people rely on mind reading and and loose rules and you know you kind of have <laughs> it like where you have sort of subjectivity. So, I don't wow. do well in those environments. But if you put mm -hmm. me in a genuine meritocratous environment mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. black and white rules, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a person alive that I won't beat. Have you considered the military, Hanok? I mean, the, 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 uh, the army. I mean, holy smokes! The old <laughs> speaking of ones and <laughs> speaking of ones and zeros. There we go. It's um, very binary, yeah. The, but uh, only the Ethiopian army. There. Oh my. Oh, Hanok, please. You, you did. You, you, you were born here, weren't you? You grew up in this beautiful nation, absolutely. America. And I got to tell you, growing up, I firmly believed in the National Guard. I think starting with Bush, the National Guard got abused because they started sending them to Afghanistan. But I always said when I was younger that. I would have enlisted in, in the American National, in the Californian National Guard, if anyone ever were to do a land invasion of us. I remember when we talked about <laughs> World War II earlier, it was one of the admirals, um, forgetting his name now, I'm so sorry to the Japanese, but there was one of the Japanese admirals when they were discussing plans of a potential land invasion of the United States. He, uh, you know, he, Admiral is one of the leaders of the Navy. He said, you know, it's not a good idea because behind every blade of grass, we would find a rifle. My gosh, unbelievable. Very strong words. Very, very strong words. Uh, it's nine o'clock. Henok, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. No, Ed, please. For... Before you go, Armando, yes, I'll yes. let you go. But before you go, yes. you have to tell us. Yes. You are in the same environment with the script. Did you have any friction in fulfilling the script? Do you remember any certain excuses that may have riled up your emotions? Or did you have any confrontations with either the supervisors or managers about how faithful you were being to the script? I do remember one particular excuse that caught me off guard. And this was when asking for a donation. And one of the, I guess, now these days you would call these, uh, uh, yeah, blocking the, the unobjection, so to say, the objection. Sorry, you cut out a little bit. Say that again. The objection that they would give, if the, we would call it the objection from the prospect, if you would, back in the call center days. I remember one distinct one was that the person wanted to trade in their horses, their horses or cattle, and they, they were trying to donate it to, to the school. And I wasn't quite sure. I mean, would the school accept the horse or the cow? Um, it seems plausible, but I think they're going after the straight raw dollar. But uh, that is one that I remember. The call center was a good place. I mean, it teaches you a lot about sales. Really. And by the way, we can discuss further about you and uh, sales further and recruiting because you did very well as well. There was a story uh, that we'll save for later where you attempted to recruit a man into into the the private home of a company and it was a smaller company but it was uh do well, you it's funny you, you 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 it's funny that you bring that up because <laughs> what what he's bringing up and it's okay the feds are listening now anyway uh, we were speaking with Ladar Levinson of Ladar, Dark Mail yeah. and he's the one who provided the encrypted email for one Edward Snowden of the Fourth <laughs> Citizen documentary and of the biopic of his name as well and he's somewhere in Russia right now. But um, yeah, we, we reached out to the dark mail runner and um, we were, we, you know, that deal didn't close. That's why I think it's funny you brought it up. The deal did not close, but we were in negotiations. We're still Facebook <laughs> was, friends to this day. Sometimes we'll comment on each other. Yeah. Um, and he may what, be watching what, this. Have you thought Ladar Levinson may be watching this? It's possible. He hasn't it's, unfriended me yet. And yeah. uh, one, one of the things we were discussing is that he didn't have a lot of hard cash to be employing the engineers that we were recruiting for in the in the tech field, the tech mm -hmm. engineers, computer engineers and scientists and big data folks. <clears throat> so what he was saying is, you know what, um, what I have is is property. So 
I could uh, get a room and maybe get a few <laughs> monk beds in there and provide oh, some housing for them. And then yes. um, I might also be able to give uh, some large amounts of <laughs> equity. And then I don't know why, Armando, you found it so comedic. Why did you find it so comedic? We spoke for about 45 minutes to an hour, I think. Well, then, because then I would hear you then pitch that company to other engineers in L.A. and San Francisco, trying to relocate them to Texas, <laughs> to the to the room of a man who's in a, in a <laughs> it is funny. It is very. Wait, wait, why is that funny to relocate into the room of a man? Why is that funny? <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> Please get a hold of yourself, sir. Tabaco, por favor. Oh man! Well, I got... I'm in tears, bro. Why Excuse are you me. crying? Your crying is making me cry. <laughs> this is why we do these recordings, by the way. <clears throat> Let me regain my composure. <laughs> Please yeah, I mean, get composed, funny... sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. I lost my composure. It's just that. That's why. That's why you and I are such friends, because we we have those. Phenomenal moments of laughter that everybody can also enjoy. Yeah, it's 904, man. I gotta wrap this up. All right, thank you. Muy buenas noches, and we gotta resurrect Buenas Noches Pepperdine <laughs> soon. Yes, thank you. So you may, yeah, all right. No, thank you.